couple weeks ago, we started the conversation about the, how the message of Jesus, the good news of Jesus, the gospel message, was so powerful that it changed the world. And the gospel, the gospel is good news. It's, it's, not, it's an announcement. It's not an advice. It's not good advice to be considered. It's a news report of what has happened. And this news report influenced an incredible man of God named Paul. And Paul went as an apostle sent to start assemblies in different parts of the known world of Jesus' followers based on the gospel. And then he leaves these cities and he writes them letters. And he continues letter after letter to bring these people back to the purity of the message, the news, Jesus Christ, Lord of all, was, was, died for your sins and was buried, on the third day, was buried and was raised on the third day. This, this news, again, it's not good advice. It's, it's news. It's an announcement. And this announcement changed the world. And we're going to be focusing on this for really all of 2020. We've got to focus on this for our whole lives as, if we call ourselves Christians. But, but very specifically, I, I felt like, man, our church needs to align ourselves a lot more with the good news of Jesus Christ. We want to be a community of the gospel. And so the title of our uh, sermon series for the next 10 months is Gospel Community. Because this is what we want to be. We want to be a community that gathers together that is influenced by the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul writes this. He says here in 1 Corinthians 15, For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Not a suggestion, not a recommendation, not a on-the-side tangential conversation, but of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. And He kind of keeps on going to all the people that, that Jesus appeared Himself to, and then He says, and then He appeared to me as to one of normally born. Paul, traveling the world, experienced he experienced so many different things in his journeys and many different interactions and relationships. And the thing he brings everyone back to as of first importance is this message that Jesus, he died, he was buried, and God raised him from the dead. And this gospel message, this good news should influence us and inform our perspectives that we would view the world through the lens of the gospel. I was thinking about it this morning, just what does the gospel, the good news of Jesus, mean to me personally? And it's, it's a little bit easier to announce and preach the gospel. It's a little bit harder to just sit down and reflect, what does it mean to me personally? And I was thinking about it, and I was like, man, the gospel to me is, is freedom from fear. Is not our world riddled with fear everywhere we go? All the systems put in place are put in place because of fear. It's amazing to me. Even my, my kids' school now, is a, they call it closed campus, right? And they put all these boundaries up, all these barriers. Why? Because there's a fear. And rightly so. Yeah. Rightly so. But, wow. There's a fear. I grew up thinking that God, and, and, and I don't blame anybody for this, but I just grew up thinking God's out to get me. And he's always kind of got me under a microscope, and he's going to catch me in the act of messing up. And yet, the gospel the gospel message is God's not out to get me, but God has done something for me. God is doing this for me. He is for us. He is not trying to get you and trap you and punish you, but he's for you. Every world religion was, was founded by somebody who was trying to get us to God or a higher being or whatever the case may be. Christianity is the only world religion that says, no, God, God came to you. God is coming to you. And in that, what will be our response as a first 
important. And so a couple weeks ago, I shared about this, about viewing the world through what we call gospel glasses. The idea that I, without my glasses, I can still see you. I can see that picture. I can see Jason all the way in the back there. I can see, but man, when I put my glasses on, I can really see Jason. I can see Jason smile back there as he's smiling as I'm talking about him right now. Like, like I can see clearly. Does that make sense? And so the idea that when we are putting on our gospel glasses, we can see the world a lot more clearly, the way that God has wanted us to see it. And I've shared this quote from C.S. Lewis, who is the author of the Chronicles of Narnia. He says, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Isn't that cool quote? I love that quote. You know what? You can take a picture of that. You can hashtag that piece if you want to. I don't care what you do with it, but this is an incredible perspective that by it, by the, by the message of the gospel, I see everything else. In this, we uncovered, I, ch- I shared a couple weeks ago that we were going to talk about four characteristics of a gospel community. I didn't want to overwhelm you, so I spoke on only two of them. So today we're going to do the other two. The gospel community, I talked about a couple of weeks, the gospel community values a spirit-led vision, that the Holy Spirit is moving and pushing the community forward. The gospel community values the gathering, that when Jesus' followers gather together, there is something incredible happening through the power of the Holy Spirit. And yet we look at it so nonchalantly. We look at it so, you know, oh, it's just church. And we called the church through the Holy Spirit to show up on time, to give our best to God. That when we sing, we sing with our mouths open, not staring. We sing. We give glory to God because the gathering, when the Jesus followers, when the gospel community gathers, is something magical happening here through the power of the Holy Spirit. Today, we're going to uncover the other two characteristics of a gospel community. Again, influenced, inspired, and informed by the gospel. Viewing relationships in the world through the lens of the gospel. Are you guys with me here this morning? Can can I get a little bit of an amen here from the church this morning? Amen. We were all shocked last Sunday at the end of church. I literally made a com- uh, an announcement and then came down and everybody's phone was buzzing with the tragic news of the helicopter crash that took nine people's lives away. In particular, obviously for the city of Los Angeles, what was the big hit was the, just the, 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 the death of Kobe Bryant yeah. and his daughter. And the human side of us is it's, it's not just him, it's, it's a father and his daughter. It's the baseball coach and his wife and their daughter. And so the human side of us looks at this and we say, you know, it's not just the people, the, the achievements of the individuals in that helicopter crash, but it's just their, their relationships, who they are as people, who they're connected to. And in the city of Los Angeles, particularly, the, 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 the tragic news of Kobe Bryant was a huge hit in our, in our city. Yeah. And it has caused so many of us to just pause, uh-huh. to consider, to think, to evaluate, to be thankful, to cry. I mean, this week, I, I woke up in the middle of the night just randomly a couple times just thinking about this. Because he was such a figure that was so entrenched within the fabric of our city. And, and, and in the social, social uh, culture of our city. And I, I, I was thinking about, I was like, you know, what, what's the one thing that Kobe was known for? And that was, what was he, he called it the mamba mentality, right? Yeah. Having a mamba mentality, having a, this extreme focus and, and work ethic. And what you're doing. And so all the social media pictures and quotes have him talking about, man, uh, um, uh, he said one thing where he's like, I don't like lazy people. Because you can't be great and not work hard or something to that effect. And I'm like, yeah, that's so true. But you think about his greatness. It's what annoyed people, Uh annoyed his own teammates, Uh 
but it's what made him great. A legend in the NBA lore. And, and I thought about this idea of Mamba mentality. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to, I think we, let's just use that today. If there's anything that we need to have as followers of Jesus, it's a Mamba mentality about the things that God wants us to have a Mamba mentality about. You guys follow me here? So the next two things we're going to talk about, these two things here are great and awesome and excellent and essential for the gospel community. But these next two things you'll find through Scripture over and over again as the two things that I believe with all my heart our Lord, the head of the body of the church, wants us to have a spiritual mamba mentality about. Look at Paul sharing about his mamba mentality. 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I'm the, after he shares about the gospel, he says, I'm the least of the apostles. I don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me, whether then it is I or they, this is what we preached, and this is what you believed. Look at Paul. Is that not a mamba mentality right there? He said, God's grace, this forgiveness that I've received through the power of Jesus Christ, through the blood of Christ, has, has given me an edge to work harder than Peter, than John, than James, than Andrew, the dudes who were actually with Jesus when he died. Peter, Paul, Paul wasn't necessarily physically there, but this grace he received because he said, I persecuted the church. I was the enemy of the church. But that forgiveness that Jesus gave to me, that grace, man, it, it has produced in me this fierce focus to work harder than all of them and spreading and announcing this incredible news that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and was raised on the third day. You guys follow me here on this? Amen. So, in the gospel community, here are two things our Lord wants us to value and have some mamba mentality about. Number one, or number three, one another relationships. Look at this picture. Isn't that a cool picture? Some of you guys are like, what is this? This is fellowship. This is the fellowship of the ring. Now, some of you guys have been coming to church here for a few years. You know that I'll, I'll often bring up these guys, you know. And yeah, that's kind of my nerd side to me. That's okay. You got your thing. I got my thing. Clay, you're with me on this, right? Clay's with me. Clay, our t awesome teen leader right here. He's awesome. He's, he's with me on this. Okay. I love this picture because look at this. Look how different everybody in that group is. You got hobbits, you got dwarves, you got elves, you got wizards, you got man. You got angry man, you got happy man. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got everybody in there. I'm like, dude, that's, that's community, right? And what happened? Their, their purpose was to, to throw, get this ring and toss it into the mountain of, Clay, say it, Clay. Mount Doom. Mount Doom. There we go. And defeat Sauron, right? right? And this purpose, right, it brought them together. And they didn't, they didn't know each other too well, but they just said, you know what? We're, we're in this together because of this higher reason. Does that make sense? And it built this community, and it built this connection. You know, the early church in the first century was, was brought together because of the gospel. And so you had rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. Now, for a Jewish person to have table fellowship and have a meal with somebody outside of, the, of Judaism was illegal, Illegal, frowned upon, you were cast aside if you even did that, and yet the gospel brought those two races of people together yeah. 
to have table fellowship, and yet still in the church, there was some drama in there. And we're going to get into that in other future sermons here this, this upcoming month. Drama, drama. <laughs> Mom. Mom's in the front row today, guys. <laughs> there was drama, Mom. Drama for your mama, right there. You know, relationships, when you think, when you look at, when you think about, think about your friends. Think about the relationships that you have. Whether they be, whether they be family members or just friends that you grew up with. Friendships are hard. They test you. Friendships, relationships are not easy. One anothering one another is not easy. It requires decisions. It requires uh, intentionality. There, there are friendships that you have, even that you grew up with, that you fight with, and then you don't talk for a few days, but then you get back together as if nothing happened, you know what I'm saying? But even that fight gets you in a funk for the next few days. You just feel funky, right? Relationships are not easy, and yet God says, through the gospel, through this good news of Jesus dying for your sins, I'm going to bring people from all nations, ethnicities, backgrounds together, into one community. Now, if your friendship already is difficult with people that you like, can you imagine what that creates? And yet, that's God's plan. Sometimes I feel like it's like, God, why would you? Like, you want to argue with God. Like, God, can we have a strategy discussion here? Why would you bring people from all backgrounds and nations and languages and socioeconomic backgrounds? Why would you do that as your vehicle? to spread this announcement that Jesus is Lord. Like, why don't you just like zap people or like do something, do something that'll get people's attention and yet God says, no, 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 this gets people's attention. Yeah. Table fellowship with somebody outside of your race, with somebody outside of your socioeconomic background, with somebody outside of where you grew up, and that, and that is brought into your home, that you meet together for, when I say table fellowship, I mean throwing down some food. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to, e- eating, was, eating was part of the fabric of the first century church. So, so can we imitate that and just eat some more? 2020 resolution right there. Let's just eat more. You know what I mean? Uh, you like, now you're like, I want to come back to this church. They eat a lot. They like to eat. This, this, is, this, is, this was God's idea. Let's bring people from all different nations and have them eat together and the world around them will see there's something different about that group. There's something different. I'm curious. And so you get out, you you sit up a little bit. You you get on the edge of your seat a little bit. You're like trying to peer over. What's going on over there? Why is the city councilman hanging out with the poor beggar in Ephesus or in Corinth or whatever the case may be? You guys follow me in here? The gospel community needs to value one another relationships. Relationships are tough. They take time. They require humility. They require vulnerability, require forgiveness, requires to be known by by people and to know others. It can be challenging, and yet the gospel provides. Jesus dying for your sins, raising on the third day, Jesus provides the strength to navigate the funkiness and the chaos of one another relationships. Look what he says here in Colossians 3. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together, in perfect unity. This is not natural. This is challenging. This requires power from the Holy Spirit. It requires a daily decision to put on the gospel glasses, to make a decision, to clothe, put some clothes on. Let me put my socks of humility on. Let me put my pants of gentleness on. Let me put my shirt of patience. Do you see what I'm saying? Clothe yourself. Jesus commands that we should love one another as he has loved. John 13. This is to be applied in these relationships where you bear with each other, where you forgive one another, constantly answering the question, what 
does love require of me? Not of her. I know what God requires of her for sure. No, no, no. What does love require of me? You know, it's interesting about relationships that the more responsibility you have in life, the more intentionality relationships require. And if we value, if we're going to value growing in Christ, then we'll invite people into our lives. We need spiritual coaching. We need spiritual friendship, spiritual pouring into other people. When we see ourselves at the foot of the cross and see how much grace we have received, we should be able to look at others and treat them with the same grace. We need each other. You guys follow me here? Amen. In the church here in Greater Long Beach, we, we want to provide two, in, two ways, two pathways to have intentional relationships and to build one another relationships. One of them, but, but here's the thing about that. It's up to you what you do with it. You see what I'm saying? You get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. So it's really up to you as an individual to put into it rather than to wait around being told what to do. You get out of it what you put into it. And so we provided two, two, uh, two ways to have relationships. Now, there's a bunch of different ways, but as a church, we said, okay, how can we meet a greater need? We need to, we need to fulfill and have a mama mentality, if you will, of, of, of one another relationships. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to do it through the venue of having family groups. And we said, you know, the, the circle, we, we learn in rows, but we grow in circles. And we've talked about that, that, that growth happens when you're in a circle environment, when you're in the living room and you're able to take a scripture and you're able to take and, and share life with one another and be open with each other. It's li life change happens. Yeah, that's right. The past few weeks has been so cool in our family group. We've been meeting um, on Tuesday nights with just the guys and there's five families in our family group. Uh, we have 13 children across the board. It's incredible. Uh, so we decided to let's take the month of January to just uh, to, to, to meet without the children so that we won't have that distraction in a way and just get involved in each other's lives. And so on Tuesday nights, we've been meeting with just the men. And on Wednesday nights, just the women have been meeting. With, uh, Marina's been meeting with the women. I've been meeting with, and I've been meeting with the guys. And we just have had a great time laughing together, joking together. Because, you know, guys, for guys, it kind of takes us about 20 minutes to kind of get deep with each other, yeah. you know? It's not like, a, oh, bro, how are you doing? It's like, let's talk about all these other things first, and then we get kind of into the thing. And then we can only probably last about a good 25 minutes of that. And then we're like, all right, what, uh, let's go back to joking with each other. You know what I'm saying? Like, but, 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 but I'm telling you, even that has been encouraging to my faith. And we've been getting open with each other. We've been confessing sin with each other. We've been uh, talking about the challenges and the tension that we have in our different relationships at home, whether, whether it be with our, our spouse or with our children or whatever the case may be, and giving each other advice. We've, we've uh, been able to share each other's back, like, like stories, like how did you, you know, how long have you been a Christian? How long this happened? Oh, you came from that. Oh, that's crazy. Like just really trying to get to know each other. It's been great. We can't do that in this setting. It's hard to do that in this setting. But we provide family groups as a way for you, for us, to grow in relationships. But you get out of it what you put into it. Yeah. So if you're not part of a family group in any life stage ministry, I would encourage you, get yourself involved in some circle and show up. Yeah. Like, don't just say, I'm going to be there and not show up. Show up. Showing up is half the battle. Yeah. Just show up. You never know what's going to happen. You don't have to say a word. Just show up yeah. and just sit there. And watch the Holy Spirit do something in your heart. That's right. Just show up. Yeah. This upcoming Wednesday, uh, we're going to start our men's midweeks. This month, we're going to be meeting with all the singles and the married and the uh, teenage men all together back here in the in, in McBride High School in the vestibule room. So starting this Wednesday for the next three weeks, all the dudes are going to be together. The campus is going to have their own midweeks on campus still as they're start as they're. Uh, building momentum to reach out to many students there. But we're going to meet with all the men. And I just want to encourage us, like, don't not show up. Just show up. You never know what can happen in, th in that kind of a setting as we listen to God's word and then break up into circles and have conversation and discussion. The other way that we provide a venue for us to have these one another relationships is through what we call discipling. 
And discipling is kind of one-on-one, meeting with somebody who may be a little bit ahead of you in your life or who's maybe in the same stage of life that you are, but being able to intentionally meet together face-to-face, one-on-one, for the sake of accountability and encouragement and mutual uh, feedback to one another. Let me tell you, my life has been so blessed by having men in my life call me out on my junk, on my stuff. Reuben, you're being prideful with your wife. Reuben, you're doing this with your kid wrong. You, Reuben, no, and it's not berating. It's, I love you enough to tell you this. You see what I'm saying? I appreciate so much. Um, we have a, a discipling relationship that we meet twice a month with uh, Steve and Jackie Marici, who lead the, the South Bay uh, Church, and they also lead our coastal L.A. region. Twice a month we get together, and what I love about Steve and Jackie is they're old enough to be our parents, but they treat us as like, it's like a give and take relationship. As much as as much advice as we receive and get from them, we talk about church stuff, we talk about marriage stuff, family stuff. But as much as we get, they also ask us, "Hey, so what do you think about this?" And this, we're thinking about making this decision. What do you think about that? How are you guys working that? And it's kind of a back and forth rela- And I love that. Amen. Who here has benefited from having somebody intentionally involved in your life? Come on. Yeah. We all have, and yet we're so easy and so quick to just discard it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Oh, I'm too busy. Oh, I got too... And then months pass, and you're like, I don't have any friends. Nobody calls me back. Nobody wants to hang out with me. Well, because you weren't intentional when you had the opportunity to be intentional. I don't like that guy. I don't like that girl. It doesn't matter what you like. Do you want to be like Christ or not? If you want to grow and be like Christ then you will involve people in your life. You will look for opportunities to give to others as well. You get out of it what you put into it. You cannot say, I want to talk about this real quick. You cannot say you're connected to God and not connected to others. Not, in your example, be connected to others. Does that make sense? Like, I have many people have tell me, well, I'm still close to God, but they've, they're, but I'm going to take a break from the church. I'm like, what? What is going on in that, head, in that brain of yours? That makes absolutely no sense logically and absolutely no sense biblically. I'm... I want to I take a retreat and a break from the body, the gathering, the people of Christ so that I may focus on my relationship with God it makes absolutely no sense. Find that in the Bible and I will listen to you. But here's the thing. Scripture doesn't talk about that. Scripture says when you're attached, you, you, your faith is to be lived out in love with other relationships. Right? Galatians, 6, Galatians 5. The only thing that counts is your faith being lived out in love. Yeah, that's right. So how can your faith be lived out in love if you're detaching yourself from the body of Christ? That's right. That's right. It's a really weird comment that I get. Yeah. And I've actually gotten it from a lot of young people. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I don't know what the deal is. Right. Like, I'm going to disconnect from the body of Christ so that I can focus on my relationship with God. And now I feel a lot more closer to God because I've disconnected from the body. That makes no sense. You talking crazy. <laughs> crazy. But, you know, I don't tell you that. When you tell me that, I just, like, nod my head. All right, cool, 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 whatever. You know, do what you got to do. And what happens when you do what you got to do? You come back, everything goes wrong. You come back full circle. Man, I should have never left. I should have never taken a break from the church. Oh, uh, duh, I told you. No, I don't say that either. I just try to like, you know, oh, yeah, you're right. Let me hug you. Come on. You know, we'll take care of you. Do you know what I'm saying? But come on. Can I encourage you if you came to their church today and you said, well, this is my last Sunday because I'm going to take a break from church so I can really focus on my relationship with God. Let me help you. God's looking at you like you're crazy because he's telling you. Your faith, your relationship with me, the Father, is to be reflected in your relationships with other people and to be lived out in that way. I got got far too long on that. Sorry about that. Can I just share something? So this is intentionality. This is something else in, in our life that we're trying to be intentional about. This past Friday night, we had a couple families gathered together, and this is this is our family circle. 
okay? So with three families, there's nine kids. Now, I know you guys laugh about that, but quite honestly, it's all our fault because any group that we're gonna be a part of, we're just gonna bring the number of kids up exponentially. So uh, we're missing two kids here. I mean, I think Jonathan's in the back behind Bella's head. And anyway, we partnered up with Alex and Elizabeth Beltran and with Rebecca White, who's a single mom, uh, in our church, and we said, you know what, we're going to try to get together once a month just to have some family devotionals together, and to eat a meal together, and to have, so we did our first, now, here's the thing about intentionality, we've been talking about this since, like, when? Last June. Since last June, in the idea stage, <laughs> and we never got on the calendar, just because of life, you got a lot of life, a lot of stuff happening, and so we say, you know what, forget it. Forget life. That's right. Let's do this. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. and we got to, and it was great. Yeah. We had a great time. We read the, we read a scripture together. We played a game together. We ate some bomb food together, and the kids were doing stuff. And we played an intense game of tensies. I don't know if you guys have played tensies, but it's with dice. And anyway, you come to my house. We play some tensies. It's it, it was incredible. <laughs> we had a great time. But what I'm saying is, it was, it was intentional. Does that make sense? We put it on the calendar. If it's not on the calendar, it won't happen. Yeah. Can I just encourage us to have some mamba mentality about our one another relationships? Amen. Can I call the church back to let's be focused on our one another relationships? Let's be focused on encouraging one another across, family, across ministry life stage lines. You know what's funny about our church? We kind of function like all the married people over here and all the single people over here and all the college people. It's kind of, have you ever gone to your Thanksgiving dinner and like, it's like all the married people over here. In a family, everybody's at the table. The only separate table is the kid's table <laughs> at times. You know what I'm saying? And, and I just want to encourage us to kind of, okay, let's get some, let's get some gospel glasses on. Amen. Gospel, I'm sorry. Let's get some <laughs> gospel glasses on. And can I, can I challenge the married people in here? When's the last time you had a single person in your home for dinner from the singles ministry or a college student? When's the last time you hosted? When's the last time you took them out for lunch? Now, I know a couple families in here are like, yo, my house is like Grand Central Station for college students over here, you know, like the Matthews house or the Varagis house, you know. Like there's some, and there's stuff like that. But I'm just saying the intentionality. Do you know how much... Some of our young people would appreciate some of our older brethren to just take them out for coffee, yeah. invite them over for, the, for a, a, a meal. Yeah. Hey, bring your laundry over too while you're at it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? All the college students. <laughs> but do you understand what I'm saying? Now, let me ask you this. Even for our single parents, you know, I love having Rebecca in our um, family circle because she's a single mom. Got two little kids. And we say, you know, she's a single mom. We, we want to encourage her. Yeah. And so she's in our little family circle. And I don't know, we might add another family or whatever. But I'm just saying it, there was an intentionality of it. We want to provide that environment for, for uh, one of our single moms. Yeah. We can't do this for everybody. But, man, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do you know what I mean? And so I think for all of us, man, let, let me have that mentality. Let me just do for one what I wish I could do for everyone. Yeah. Amen. Single person, how receptive are you to input from brothers and sisters outside of your life stage? Ooh, how much do you go after these relationships? You know, a single person, whether it be college student or a, a you know, single professional, many times has the goal or wanting to be financially uh, you know, self-supporting as well as uh, eventually having a family. And yet they're getting all their advice from people in the same stage. Yeah. Uh -oh. Instead of chasing down somebody who's actually done it, it. Yeah. and is doing it, yeah. and saying, hey, can you just tell me what you've learned? And then we'll tell you all about the debt that we're in and everything. You know, whatever the case may be, but I'm just saying all the mistakes that we learned. And I'm telling you, wisdom is learning from other people's mistakes. Yeah. So sit down with a married brother or sister and listen to all the mistakes they made and say, I will not do that. Amen. All the married people are like, amen. 
Okay, we're going to bring it in for a landing here. I'm sorry. I just, you know, I feel like, you know, we're kind of like at a coffee shop right now, just kind of, I'm just venting here, you know. But he he here's the deal. We got to go after one another relationships. We got to go after one another relationships, okay? Lastly, the gospel community values proclaiming the gospel. We value proclaiming the gospel. If there's anything we want to have a mamba mentality about, it's going to be one another relationships, and it's going to be pro the proclamation of the gospel. The gospel was special to the first century Christian. I mean, the gathering was special for the, to the first century Christian, because it, but it was a celebration of a life that was to be lived to God's glory throughout the week. You see, so we gather together to celebrate what God's done, and then we live our life in the community, in the neighborhood, at our jobs, whatever the case may be, being a light to the world, salt of the earth, by working hard, being a good example in school excellence, pursuing career development for the glory of the king and not for your own advancement. Your neighborhood, your school, your community is only as open to the gospel as our mouth is. When the early church was persecuted and scattered, Luke, the author of Acts, tells us that they left Jerusalem and they spread the word, it says, wherever they went. When Peter was arrested and then released, Luke tells us that the church in Acts chapter 4 prayed for more boldness. They didn't pray for Peter's safety. They didn't pray for the church to stay safe. They said, give us more boldness that we may proclaim the gospel. Jesus is Lord. Amen. You know, in our church, we celebrate everyone who makes a decision to be baptized or to be restored to the God and his family. But how many souls, more souls, are looking and searching for hope, light, joy in the challenges? You and I have the message of good news, of great joy that changed the world and will continue to change the world. I'm telling you, this tragic accident this past week makes us sober to the fact that life is fleeting. We're here one day and gone the next. It's made me personally aware of my need to be more grateful, more present in the moment, and also prioritize what is a priority to Jesus. Which is what? Love one another and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. In fact, love one another as I have loved you, he says. Yeah. Yeah. And so my question to you today is, how often do you pray about having evangelistic impact? How often are you being intentional in your evangelism? Do others around you at your job or at school or in your neighborhood or on the baseball team or on the soccer team even know that you're a follower of King Jesus? Do they even know? Or would your example confuse them because they think that you're just like everybody else? Like, do they even know? I remember one time being so embarrassed in high school one time. I was, I was uh, uh, you know, uh, there was a uh, kid in my class who was studying the Bible with one of my other friends from the teen ministry, and I was in his class, but I was always falling asleep in class, and I was always like, you know, it's so boring. And, and then, um, and, and he was telling me, he's like, hey, Reuben, I kind of want to talk to you about these Bible studies because you don't seem like you're that into it as much as these guys are. And I was a disciple. I'm a disciple. I'm like following. I'm like trying to be in the team ministry. I'm trying to like, and it just convicted me like, wow, this guy, because of my example, thinks that I'm not into it as much as my friend who's in another class who's in the team ministry and our team leader. Does that make sense? Yeah. So I'm like a weak sauce disciple, and they're a strong sauce disciple. And I'm like, oh, dude. And I started backtracking. No, 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 I'm really into it. I'm really into it. I, 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 I do believe. I, you know what I mean? <laughs> I started stuttering and stuff like that. But it was so embarrassing. And I wonder how many times I've done that in my Christian walk. How many times have we done that? Well, we're at work for years, and nobody at work knows that we're a disciple. Or we're in the neighborhood, and nobody knows that we're followers of Jesus. Or we take our kids through soccer and baseball and basketball, and nobody on the team knows that we're a follower. And it doesn't have to do with, come to church, come to church. It doesn't have to do with that. It's just how you live your life that preaches the gospel. You guys follow me here? Let me tell you, one of the areas that, that we, 
when it comes to evangelism, when it comes to proclaiming the gospel, we got we to gotta go where people are. In our generation, where are people? They are on their phones. They are on their computers. They are on their tablets. And where is the church? We're still trying to go door knocking. We're still trying to go to the mall and just, you know, evangelize like that or whatever. And I was thinking about it, I'm like, do you know if we started investing more of our resources in online evangelism, how many random people would just come through that door? I, I've seen, I've met people that have just found us through our tent that was outside. Or through, hey, I just was looking up long, you know, churches in Long Beach and I showed up. And yet we weren't prepared. Because we wanted to talk to all our friends and ignore a new guest. So I want to challenge the church here. Can we all, we are all, we can all evangelize and proclaim the gospel in our social media. We don't even know that. We evangelize other things. Our fanaticism over a certain sports team our romantic endeavors and achievements. We, we evangelize so many different things, and yet when it comes to the most incredible news ever announced in the world, we, shot, we stay quiet. Do you know every picture that you take here at church and then you tag or, or uh, you tag the GLB church on there or do our hashtag? Do you know what? That, that evangelizes. Do you know we're going to have, uh, so we said, okay, we're going we're gonna to beef this up a little bit. So um, we, we uh, as a church, said, okay, let's hire uh, Johnny Cook, who's over here taking pictures over here. Let's hire Johnny, and we can, we can praise God for that, amen? Let's hire Johnny, and listen, Johnny, Johnny is not full-time in the ministry. He's, a, he's working part-time for the church to help take pictures, for example, like he's doing today, to help... Uh, our website presence, to help our uh, social media presence, to help all these things move forward in our printing and new cards, new invitation cards, everything, kind of unifying everything so that we can be evangelistic Amen. online. And I'll tell you, here's what could happen. We've had churches do this where they invest so much of their attention on their online presence, including the live stream and making the stage look nice and the visual, what it looks like. Because here's the thing, a lot of people will check out what happens here on a Sunday first online before they come. And we're over here with shadows on the wall and looking all kind of funky online on the, on the video. And, and, and the disciples love it because they're like, oh, great job, guys. But what about that guy who's just like, man, I'm just looking. I'm just looking. And they see every church that's just kind of sad looking or whatever, you know. Why don't we have an online presence where the Christians in the gathering are actually happy to be in the gathering? Yes. Where we can take impromptu pictures and the people are actually smiling when they sing. Yes. I looked around this morning, and I understand we can be tired, but I looked around this morning and some people are singing like this. We're over here like, it is well. And you're over here like this. Like all joyful about your Christianity. You know what I'm saying? And then Johnny's over here taking a picture of you, posting it like, I don't want to go to that church. They look kind of sad. I'm just saying, I'm not trying to be fake here. I'm just trying to say, let's, let's, let's be joyful as a community. What we have in our community is special. It's awesome. And so why not promote that where people are already? And they're on there looking at stuff. They're looking for us, and they're looking for where to, they can go to worship. And then all of a sudden, they find GLB Church and say, yo, they look great. I want to go over there. What does that require? It requires for all of us to be involved. It requires for all of us to be taking pictures, posting stuff, and it requires all of us to, uh, to, to be involved in, in helping, you know, let, maybe we need to raise more money to be able to find more things to make this stage look greater so it can be on live stream and look all nice or whatever. Maybe I need to get some new shirts or something like that. I don't know what the case is, but let's do something. And, and then let's be prepared for those people. 
more welcoming, more warm. You know, a new guest should be able to sit, meet five to seven new people when they get here from the church and not just like be ignored. But if we're not prepared, do you think God's going to bless if we're not prepared? Can we just prepare for rain and see what God does as he opens the floodgates and Amen. pours down his blessing? What does that mean? That means we need more people helping us with our audiovisual ministry, yeah. set up and tear down. That means we need people that have ideas on how to get our social media going and get the SEO going and to get all that different. We need people. If you're in that field, come talk to Johnny. Yeah. Get on the team. Bring your camera. Help us figure this out. Help us figure out ways to, you know, we need a team to set this up. We need people to serve in our guest experience ministry to be prepared. Oh, I don't want to serve this Sunday. Well, that's because you're not concerned about the mission. It's just me and God. I'm going to take a break from church. Nah, it's not you and God. Because if it's you and God, you'd be like, I'm here every Sunday with all my heart. Even when I'm feeling down, I'm going to come and hopefully God will do something in that time. Should we pray for communion now? Sorry. <laughs> Romans says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Look what Paul's telling the Roman church. He says, in the gospel, the power of God, that's where the righteousness of God is revealed. In the gospel. And how is that gospel lived out? In relationships. In a community that, pro, that values proclaiming the gospel. Paul, unashamed of the gospel. Mamba mentality about the mission God had given him because of the gospel. Because of God's grace. Zealous, passionate, persevering to the glory of God. Should that not describe us today, church? A mamba in mentality about our involvement in each other's lives. A mamba mentality about our mission to move people towards Christ. A mamba mentality about being gospel-centered, gospel-influenced by the gospel to be a community for all generations, loving others and reaching all generations with the gospel. Some people ask me, what's your, what's your vision for 2020? I just want us to be who God wants us to be as his people. If we could just start reflecting more and more the image of Christ within the community, wouldn't that be great? I'm not out here trying to plant all these churches and we got to baptize all these people. I'm just saying, can we, God's people, be who he has called us to be? Amen. Focus. On, on the Holy Spirit, focused on our gathering, focused on our one another relationships, and focused on the proclamation of the gospel. Your move. Number one, be intentional in your one another, one another relationships. Go after it. Can you just make a decision this week? I'm just going to host somebody. I'm going to be hospitable with somebody. Or I'm going to go down. I'm gonna, I have a discipling partner I haven't met with in six months. I'm going to actually meet with them this week. Can we just do that? Be intentional. I would like to have, I saw that picture of a family circle. I would like to have one. Well, put it on the calendar. Get some families together and stop talking about it. Do it. Number two, pray for gospel opportunities. This week, pray for it. God, give me an opportunity to proclaim the gospel today and see what God does. The question is, will you be aware of the opportunity? Will you walk in step with the Spirit enough to where you're aware? Huh. That person's watching. Or oh, that person asked me a question. Man, there are so many people who are looking, yeah. searching, yeah. seeking for what you and I have. We're going to go to God in prayer here as we take communion. Let's be a gospel community. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has arisen, not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. Let's pray. Our Lord in heaven, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cup that we get to take right now, representing the blood of Christ. Thank you for the bread that we get to take, representing the body of Christ. Thank you for your patience with us. Thank you for your compassion. 
Thank you for your mercy. We honor you. We praise you. We want to be your people. Prioritizing your priorities. Having our hearts broken for what breaks your heart. Being unashamed of the gospel. Because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. In Jesus' name, amen.